Welcome to the um, uh, first seminar of the year for the Electoral Regulation Research Network in, uh, in Victoria. Um, it's really my delight to actually uh, have as our first speaker for the year, uh, Dr. Yi Fu Yun. Um, uh, not only has she uh, published on really what is a very neglected but a significant area of public policy, uh, <coughs> dealing with ministerial advisors, but she's really a, really a stalwart of the network. Um, She's a convener of the network here in Victoria, as well as also a, the, uh, the legal editor of our biannual um, newsletter. Uh, so really, without further ado, uh, um, oh, well, maybe with a little bit of ado, uh, the, 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 the seminars are based on uh, um, EFO's really fine book on ministerial advisors. Uh, it was a finalist in the, in, uh, the uh, Holt uh, Book Prize competition. And uh, you see from her presentation that it really uh, uh, really, it's what a really a very notable piece of legal scholarship that is uh, uh, draws upon a really quite a deep command of the law, but really wheezing an understanding of how the law works, and uh, from quite extensive interviews from those actually are subject to the law. So now, without any further ado, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for coming to everybody and it's really good to see some friends and former colleagues in the audience so thank you for coming. Um, as Yu Xiong said before, this talk emanates from my PhD which was published as a book by Federation Press on ministerial advisors in Australia, the modern legal context. And in that vein, I have to thank or I very happily thank my PhD, uh, who, Greg Taylor, who supervised me for my PhD. Thank you very much. Of course, I'd like to thank Ju Chong for giving me the opportunity to speak, um, not just today, but also four years ago when I was just testing my findings. And now that I know what my findings are, I'm speaking again. So thank you, Ju Chong, twice. So first of all, it's hard to feel sorry for politicians but yet, it's undeniable that a modern-day minister has many different responsibilities, including managing policy, the media, and political issues. Ministers also have to mediate with and appease various stakeholders, including constituents and interest groups. Within the political structure, they have to work cooperatively with their prime minister, members of parliament, and their political party. It is impossible for one person to shoulder all of these tasks single-handedly. Newly elected ministers are faced with a vast and bewildering bureaucracy inherited from the previous government. Although the public service is meant to be impartial, ministers may not be willing to trust the bureaucracy who had just been serving their political opponents a few moments ago. And ministers understandably therefore have the desire to have partisan advisors whom they trust to advise them. This has led to the rise of the ministerial advisor. Ministerial advisors are personally appointed by ministers and work out of ministers' private offices. In the last 40 years, ministerial advisors have become an integral part of the political landscape. It all started from the informal kitchen cabinets where friends and relatives of the ministers gathered around the kitchen table to discuss political advice and strategies. This has since become formalized and institutionalized into the role of the partisan ministerial advisor as distinct from the impartial public service. The number of Commonwealth ministerial staff increased from 155 in 1972 to 415 in 2015, an increase of 173%. Ministerial advisors undertake a wide range of functions. Tony Nutt, a former ministerial advisor, stated that a ministerial advisor deals with the press, a ministerial advisor handles the politics, a ministerial advisor talks to the union. All of that happens every day of the week, everywhere in Australia, all the time, including, frankly, the odd bit of, you know, ancient Spanish practices and a bit of bastardry on the way through. That's all the nature of politics. 
Okay, the bell means I've run out of time. Goodbye. No. Okay. So in my research, I've interviewed 22 current and former ministers and members of parliament, including three former premiers, two former treasurers, five former senior ministers, one leader of the Greens, and two former speakers of the House. A strong theme that comes from the interviews is that ministerial advisers are extremely influential. The interviewee stated that some ministerial advisers, such as the chief of staff to the prime minister and other very senior ministers, were more powerful than many ministers and members of parliament. Deputy former Premier John Twait said that often the ministerial advisers that you find in the prime minister and premier's office are as powerful or more powerful than ministers. The head of the media unit, the chief of staff, and maybe one or two advisers in the prime minister's and premier's office are more powerful, have more influence on the decision making in most cases than certainly, certainly junior ministers and more than most other ministers. Some ministerial advisers are also given significant discretion to speak on their minister's behalf. Beyond this, there's an intimacy that develops between ministers and their advisers due to the high-pressure political environment and the long working hours involved in working in a minister's office. Former Minister Lindsay Tanner stated that there is an intimacy in a ministerial office. People work ridiculous hours. You are living in each other's pockets. It's a relatively small area. You are under intense pressure. So the perceived power of ministerial advisors, some of it just arises from that intimacy. And by definition, you have access, and you're talking about the weather and the football. So there's a trust or there's a bond. And there's a much more fertile ground for these kinds of exchanges than someone who's coming to see you every two days. Former Premier Steve Bratt said that ministers may see their advisors more than they see their partner. This, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. poor partners. So this creates a relationship forged in fire, leading to intimacy, trust and confidence between ministers and their advisors. Peter Kredlin, former Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister, is a notable example of a formidable ministerial advisor who was widely regarded as one of the most powerful figures in Australian politics. She was rated as Australia's most powerful woman in the Australian Women's Weekly Power 100 list and was ranked as number one in Business Review Weekly's Spinners and Advisors Power Index. And yes, there is a Spinners and Advisors Power Index. So, um, so that says something in itself. So there were frequent media reports about Kredlin giving directions to and berating ministers and members of parliament. Kredlin also sat in on cabinet meetings and vetted ministerial staff selections and media appearances to their consternation. A liberal insider said, she's tough, She's a player, she makes demands, she gives directions, she balls people out. Kredlin undoubtedly had a lot more power and influence than many ministers. The star of ministerial advisors has well and truly risen. At the same time, there is a reduction of the influence of public servants relative to ministerial advisors. For instance, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd would ignore his department for months at a time and essentially throws out the secretary of his own department. Consequently, ministerial advisors became the primary source of his advice. But perhaps the reduction in public service influence is best illustrated by a story told by one of the interviewees. He was at the opening of Monash Sucho, which was attended by the Victorian Premier, the Premier's Chief of Staff, and the departmental secretary. And there was just one chair in the front row for the departmental secretary, but not for the chief of staff. And the chief of staff said to the departmental secretary, move over. And the departmental secretary moved over. The chief of staff sat in the front row. 
So this is a good physical representation of the locus of power shifting from public servants to ministerial advisors. There has thus been a significant change in the structure of the executive due to the addition of ministerial advisors as an additional layer between ministers and public servants. However, ministers and public servants are subject to elaborate administrative law accountability frameworks, while ministerial advisors operate in a fluid, largely unregulated universe. The insertion of ministerial advisors into the executive can be seen as a new public management imperative to increase the responsiveness of the public service to the elected, politician, elected politicians. Former Prime Minister Paul Keating noted that the public service reforms in the 1980s were intended to bolster the position of ministers relative to the public service. Um, and as well as to increase the responsiveness of the public service. Former Minister David Kemp said that the intent of the ministerial staff system was to counter the impact of an imperial public service that was not elected and had an excessive influence on government and was not under the control of the elected government. This shows that the motivation for the introduction of the ministerial advisor system was to directly counteract the influence of the public service on ministers, as well as to enhance the efficiency of the system. However, I argue that the rise of ministerial advisors shows the triumph of efficiency over accountability. This is particularly clear in terms of the appearances of ministerial advisors before parliamentary committees. In a couple of incidents, ministerial advisors have been banned from appearing before parliamentary committees on the basis that there's a constitutional convention that they do not appear. This happened in the Children Overboard incident at the Commonwealth level and the Hotel Windsor incident at the state level in Victoria. In the Children Overboard incident in 2001, the Prime Minister claimed that an asylum seeker boat was exceptional. The passengers had thrown their own children overboard. Within a few days, several public servants found out that the children overboard story was false. They notified a ministerial advisor of the Defence Minister about this. Nonetheless, ministers continued to make public statements about asylum seekers throwing children overboard as part of an election campaign. When pressed for evidence, the press secretary of the defence minister asked a public servant to email two photographs to him. The photos were actually of two brave Navy sailors who rescued terrified asylum seekers and their children in the open sea when their boat sank. The press secretary was informed soon after that the photos were not of the children overboard incident, but of the rescue operation. The ministers released these photographs to the media as evidence of children being thrown overboard. Even after being made aware that the photos were misleading, the ministers did not correct the public record. A Senate committee was formed to investigate the children overboard incident. The government refused to allow ministerial advisers to appear before the Senate committee, claiming that there was a constitutional convention that ministerial advisers do not appear before Commonwealth parliamentary committees. The Senate committee was highly critical of this, stating that such bans and refusals are anathema to accountability. At state level, Peter Duke, a media advisor to the Minister for Planning, had a very bad day in 2010. She accidentally sent an email to a journalist at the ABC instead of her manager, as we all do, as we all do. So the email contained the minister's media plan, which stated that the minister's office intended to run a sham public consultation for the $260 million redevelopment of the iconic Hotel Windsor. In an interview, the minister denied any knowledge of the media plan or strategy. The minister said that Ms. Duke used inappropriate language and poetic license 
in a speculative document. A legislative council standing committee created an inquiry into the Hotel Windsor redevelopment planning process. The Victorian Attorney General refused to allow ministerial advisers to appear before the parliamentary committee, claiming that there was a constitutional convention that prevented ministerial advisers from appearing before parliamentary committees. The committee concluded that its investigations were significantly hindered as a result of the Attorney General's interference. The Children of Abort and Hotel Windsor incidents highlight a method that ministers can use to effectively evade their responsibility to Parliament. First, they refuse to appear before upper house committees on the basis that they have an immunity from being summoned before the other house of Parliament. They then blame their ministerial advisers for certain actions or inactions and distance themselves from the uh, conduct of their advisers. Following that, they forbid their advisers from appearing before parliamentary committees and making any other public appearances. In this way, both the ministers and the ministerial advisers do not appear before upper house committees to provide an explanation, accept a sanction, and provide rectification. Thus, all facets of accountability are undermined from explanatory accountability, where the minister explains their actions, to the minister accepting any sanction for their behaviour and then undertaking remedial action to rectify the issue. If both ministers and ministerial advisers do not appear before parliamentary committees, ministers are able to effectively es escape scrutiny for their actions and deny responsibility for controversial events or policies. This creates an accountability gap where no one takes explanatory or amendatory responsibility for public controversies and scandals. Consequently, the basic tenet of responsible government that seeks to ensure executive accountability is undermined. This is a failure at the systemic level where ministers are able to utilise ministerial advisers to avoid their own responsibility to parliament. In terms of the law, Parliament has very strong powers to summon witnesses to appear before parliamentary committees. Section 49 of the Constitution imports the powers and privileges of the United Kingdom House of Commons in 1901. There's a similar provision for the Victorian Constitution as well. And these include the power to compel the attendance of witnesses, arrest those who do not comply, and compel those witnesses to answer their questions. This was preserved by the Commonwealth Parliamentary Privileges Act, which was passed as a form of partial declaration of the powers, privileges, and immunities of Parliament. Generally, Commonwealth Parliamentary Committees are given the power to call for witnesses and documents. However, the source of their power differs based on the committees standing and select committees derive their powers from the standing orders or resolutions of the House, while committees un established under statute have the powers to call for witnesses and documents provided by statute. So it is clear that the Commonwealth Houses of Parliament and parliamentary committees have the power to order the appearance of persons and the production of documents where a person does not attend the parliamentary committee despite an order by the committee, the committee cannot pun punish the individual directly but must report the matter to the House. The House can then punish for contempt those who do not comply with their orders. Section 7 of the Parliamentary Privileges Act provides the Commonwealth House of Parliament with the power to impose punishment for contempt including imprisoning a person for six months or imposing a fine of $5,000 on an individual or $25,000 on a corporation. So here we have a disjuncture between law and politics where the legal position is clear that Parliament has the power to summon 
ministerial advisors to appear before parliamentary committees, while there's a political or constitutional convention claimed that ministerial advisors do not appear before parliamentary committees. My research tells yet another story about the existence of a constitutional convention regarding ministerial advisors appearing before parliamentary committees. Constitutional conventions are quite mysterious creatures. There is no general consensus on when a constitutional convention arises or even what the essential features of a convention are. However, there are a few features that are said to characterise constitutional conventions. Um, these are that conventions are not law. Political participants believe that the conventional rule is binding and arguably the conventions have to have a reason. I have conducted interviews with current and former ministers and members of parliament about their beliefs as to whether there is a constitutional convention that ministerial advisers do not appear before parliamentary committees. The literature shows that the belief of political participants is an essential element before a convention is formed. From my interviews of nine Commonwealth politicians, none of them believed that there was a convention that ministerial advisers could not appear before parliamentary committees in all circumstances. Two participants believed that there was a convention that ministerial advisers could appear voluntarily or in exceptional circumstances. Former, minister, former senior ministers Kim Carr and Peter Costello objected to ministerial advisers appearing before parliamentary committees on the basis that it allows ministers to evade their own accountability to parliament by allowing the advisor to take the blame for the controversies. For example, Peter Costello was worried that ministers would seek to shift the blame to their advisors. He said, to me, it would look really weak if you sent your advisors in to take the rap for you. However, Carr and Costello agreed that advisors could appear voluntarily or in exceptional circumstances. A majority of the participants believed that there was no binding constitutional convention preventing ministerial advisers from appearing before parliamentary committees. Two participants explicitly denied that there was such a convention. Most believe that the precedent of the children overboard incident was not binding and they could change their position in the future. Two participants took a very cynical view towards conventions generally. For instance, a senior liberal minister stated that conventions are only practiced until they are broken. Similarly, former minister Lindsay Tanner stated that conventions can be in the eye of the beholder and do not survive a brutal assault driven by political reasons. On an issue of this kind, people will tend to do whatever suits their short-term political interests and try to dress them up as some kind of vaguely credible precedent. But in truth, and what you probably find, is that various parties will adopt contradictory positions depending on whether or not they are in government or in opposition. At the Victorian level, except for one political actor, all interviewees rejected the existence of a constitutional convention. Former Premier John Brumby, who was Premier at the time of the Hotel Windsor incident, stated that he believed that there was a long-standing convention, that ministerial advisers are not called and do not appear before parliamentary committees. He stated, at the end of the day, you've got to have some limits on who you call. Is it your personal staff? Is it your executive assistant? Is it your partner? At the end of the day, it is the minister who is responsible. It is clearly correct that it is necessary to draw the line about who should be called before parliamentary committees. However, the difference between ministerial advisers appearing before parliamentary committees compared to a minister's partner is that ministerial advisers exercise significant public functions and may be able to shed light on issues discussed by the parliamentary committees. 
10 other Victorian political participants did not feel bound by a constitutional convention that ministerial advisers do not appear before parliamentary committees. Rather, when they are in opposition, they would feel free to change their position on that issue. The general consensus from the Victorian interviews is that at the very least, ministerial advisers should appear where they are acting independently, but not be required to speak on policy. For example, former Premier Steve Bragg said, I don't think there's any such convention, number one. Number two, it's a matter of practice. And my view is that if a minister is required to attend, you should use the same test for an advisor attending. They are one and the same. On that basis, Bragg thought that ministerial advisors should have appeared before parliamentary committees in both the Children Overboard and Hotel Windsor incidents. Former Premier John Kane thought that ministerial advisers should appear before parliamentary committees where their functions intrude into government bureaucratic processes, such as when they comment upon advice to the minister. However, when ministerial advisers are advising on political, factional or intra-party issues, Grant Kane thought it was not appropriate for them to appear before the committees. He stated that the refusal to allow ministerial advisers to appear before parliamentary committees when they provided public policy advice was self-serving for the minister of the day. Greg Barber, leader of the Victorian Greens Party, was a member of the parliamentary committee in the Hotel Windsor incident, stated that what we have here is not so much a convention, we have a straight-out agreement between Labour and Liberal that neither of them wants to upset the apple cart. None of them want to bring ministerial advisers into the formal system. They like them out there in the never-never world. Therefore, from the interviews, the conventional requirement that the rule be considered binding by the political participants is not satisfied at both the Commonwealth and the Victorian levels. Um, there is thus no constitutional convention that ministerial advisers are prevented from appearing before parliamentary committees. There is currently a stalemate between the government and the parliament about the appearance of ministerial advisers before the parliamentary committees. The law is very clear that houses of parliament and parliamentary committees have very strong powers to compel ministerial advisers to appear. However, the politics of the situation has played out very differently. In a few incidents, ministerial advisers have been banned from appearing before parliamentary committees on the basis that there's a constitutional convention that they do not appear. The empirical research I've conducted demonstrates that political participants do not regard themselves as bound by any rules about ministerial advisers appearing before parliamentary committees. In short, ministerial advisers fall in the gap between law and convention. And this has happened because there are fractures and fissures in our conceptualization of the executive in Australia, legal, political, and managerial. Our legal understanding of the executive in Australia is permeated with its historic roots from the United Kingdom. The monarch formed the original basis of executive power and there are continuing links as Australia remains a constitutional monarchy. However, over the years, the High Court has been increasingly keen to assert a uniquely Australian version of the executive and executive power, which is derived by section, from Section 61 of the Constitution rather than the prerogative powers inherited from the United Kingdom. The Australian Constitution provides a strong framework of executive accountability through parliamentary control of executive spending and judicial review of decisions of officers of the Commonwealth. And this means that the Constitution sets up a scheme of watchful scrutiny um, of the executive by the other branches of government. The legal controls are generally effective in constraining the decisions of ministerial advisers. However, this form of accountability is limited 
to a very small subset of the actions of ministerial advisors that trespass into the boundaries of exercising executive power. The political narrative shares the same backbone as the legal narrative through the principles of ministerial responsibility and responsible government. However, the political narrative emphasizes the reduced power of parliament due to the strong influence of political parties. The political narrative of the executive is expressed either as a lament by external commentators about the Westminster system being circumvented by politicians or a cynical manipulation of the concepts of ministerial responsibility and responsible government by politicians towards their short-term political ends. This leads to a weak form of accountability where the government and opposition take differing positions, not based on principle, but on political expediency. At the same time, each of the major political parties has an incentive not to push too hard on the issue of ministerial advisers. This systemic flaw is shown by ministerial advisers not appearing before parliamentary committees as ministers seek to avoid their own responsibility to parliament and strategically use ministerial advisers to evade accountability. This leads to an accountability vacuum. The managerial account of the executive seeks to enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of the operations of the executive. The focus is on adopting private sector principles to improve the functioning of the executive. Public servants are seen as can-do managers who have to operate in a business-like way. However, an excessive focus on efficiency can undermine accountability. This is because the executive is not a simple private sector body whose predominant role is profit maximization. Rather, the executive has a range of additional responsibilities in addition to efficiency, such as the requirements of accountability, transparency, and procedural fairness. Therefore, there are fractures and fissures in the way that we conceptualize the executive in Australia. The legal, political, and man managerial narratives have different underlying values and there is currently no coherent way of resolving clashes between these different values. The disjuncture between the legal, political, and managerial narratives leads to systemic failures of accountability. To sum up, there are failings at an institutional level in the Australian system of public administration. This has been exacerbated by the rise of ministerial advisors in the Australian system of government, the manipulative behaviour of politicians and the unreflective adoption of the new public management efficiency approach. So here we are, caught between law and convention, continuity and change. Thank you.